Hi, I'm Pastor Richard Myers, and welcome to our uh, live stream here tonight uh, for our Maundy Thursday service here at Shiloh Reformed Church in Faith, North Carolina. I'm glad that you can join us, and just wanted to spend some time reflecting tonight uh, on our lives and where we are with all this COVID-19 uh, pandemic going around and all that, and there's no better service in the year to do that than I think a uh, Maundy Thursday service, given what we're talking about here tonight. As we get started, I want to talk about, uh, oddly enough, a 2011 movie entitled The Muppets. You'll notice that comes back from our childhood. It's kind of a rebooted uh, movie, but uh, many of us went to see it even as adult men and women and uh, enjoyed reminiscing about our childhood years. But in that movie, you have Mary, who is played by the actress uh, Amy Adams, and one of the guys has just kind of stood her up as she's walking into the diner, and she's all by herself, and you have this soft, somber move, uh, music playing in the background, and all of a sudden, though, as she sits down at the table, the movie catches the audience off guard as all of a sudden she breaks out into lively, exuberant song and dance as she's singing the words with the band playing behind it, if you will, I am having a me party, a party by myself, a me party. I don't need nobody else. I'm having a me party. I'm the first and last to show. There's no one at this party that I don't already know. Well, that evokes a few laughs for those that are watching the movie, but for those of us that are familiar with isolation and loneliness, we know that it is no laughing matter. That's why often over the years so many sad songs have resonated with us as we have gone through seasons of loneliness in our own lives. And perhaps one of the most haunting tunes that I've ever heard that captures some of our worst fears is in the Beatles' 1966 hit song, Eleanor Rigby. The song is about a couple of lonely people, a lady, of course, named Eleanor Rigby, and a priest named Father Mackenzie. As it describes their loneliness while they go through the motions of life, the song culminates at the end with these words Paul McCartney sings. Eleanor Rigby died in the church and was buried along with her name. Nobody came. Father Mackenzie, wiping the dirt from his hands as he walks from the grave, no one was saved. All the lonely people, where do they all come from? All the lonely people, where do they all belong? I wonder tonight, with all the talk of social distancing and all the statewide state-at-home orders that are out there during this COVID-19 pandemic, I wonder how many people are struggling, struggling with loneliness. I think of the folks who are stuck at home all by themselves. But then I think about all the lonely people in the world, even when there is no pandemic going on. I think about the folks in nursing homes who, where it seems their families and friends have forgotten them. I think of the young people in elementary and middle school who are struggling to fit in, but yet they continue to be ostracized by their peers. I think of the high school and college students who are still trying to find a group of friends or a social group to be a part of. And I think of the person who's hurting, but no one seems to be able to understand their pain, much less has the time to care. The truth is, there's a lot of people who are lonely in this world. Deep down inside, behind all the smiles. And on tonight, I want to spend some time talking about loneliness. Loneliness can be a heavy burden to bear. We can know hundreds of people. We can have thousands of friends on Facebook. We can send thousands and receive thousands of texts each and every day. We can be married and have children. We can go to church every Sunday, and yet with all the people around us, we can still have this deep sense of loneliness. 
tonight if you find yourself feeling socially disconnected, which I would imagine almost all of us do to various degrees. I want to invite you to share this table with me here that was prepared a little over 2,000 years ago by Jesus Christ. And by the end of our time together, if you are already a Christ follower or perhaps maybe ready to become a Christ follower, at that point I will invite you to join in this sweet communion and connection with Jesus Christ as we gather around this table. He sacrificed so much to prepare for us. But not only as we connect to Him, but that we connect with one another. You know, you don't have to be in the same room to connect with Jesus and his church family. And so I hope you'll join us in that communion tonight before the night is over. I want to start off by saying, though, that Jesus understands loneliness on a level deeper than most of us can ever begin to imagine. He knew what it was like to go through isolation and feel all by himself no matter what the source, and he went through many different types. You know, he was blessed to have a mother, and I would call him an adopted father in uh, Mary and Joseph, and they loved him dearly. I don't think there's any question about that. I don't think God would have selected them otherwise. But they didn't always understand this God child whom they were raising. We see an early example of that in Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 41. So there we read, every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. You know, as I read this, I can't help but to think of that 1990 Christmas movie, Home Alone, where in it, the McAllister family, the family that has eight children, they have to rush as they get up late and they're trying to rush and get everything frantically together so that they don't miss their flight to Paris, France. And they're trying to herd all their eight children together and it's all this chaos. But it isn't until they get over the Atlantic Ocean and they're in the air that they realize that they left their eight-year-old Kevin, played by Macaulay Culkin, at home all alone. You know, I can't help but to imagine that that's what Mary and Joseph must have felt like as they were in a day's journey in their family, extended family caravan, and then all of a sudden they start, Where, anybody seen Jesus? Where is he? And they start looking for him among all their family members, and then suddenly they realize he's not with us. I imagine the response that the McAllister parents had in that movie looked something like the response and the horror that Mary and Joseph must have experienced at that time years ago. You know, they not only had the pressure of parenting that we all feel, but they were parenting God's one and only Son, whom God Almighty had entrusted to their care, and they lost him. As parents, we can only imagine the horror that was in their hearts and filled them. And so we continue when we get to verse 46. It says, after three days, imagine that. After three days of looking throughout that uh, city, <laughs> it says they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone heard him, who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, now listen to what she says. Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand. 
what he was saying to them. What's amazing to me in this whole passage is the teachers in the temple were amazed at this 12-year-old boy's understanding, yet this 12-year-old boy's parents didn't understand him. Mary, perhaps filled with both a mixture of guilt of accidentally leaving him behind as well as the sense of relief in finding him, blurts out, Son, why have you, don't miss this, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been looking all over the place for you. Do you notice who Mary's putting the blame on? On Jesus. In response, Jesus, with a sense of peace and no sense of panic whatsoever, simply responds, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? When you think about it, it's almost as if Jesus gently rebukes her. Jesus was not being a smart aleck preteen here. He was merely pointing out a truth and a perspective that Joseph and Mary didn't yet fully grasp. Even at a young age, Jesus already had a sense of who he was and what he was to do. But his parents misunderstood him and his mission. I wonder, have any of us ever been misunderstood by a parent, a spouse, or someone else? Perhaps God called you to do something and those around you just didn't get it. Perhaps you said no to doing something for good reasons, but others didn't understand your decision and so they tried to shame you or give you a guilt trip. Or perhaps you have struggled with something in a way that others just didn't get. Or they sometimes claim to understand what your struggles may be and they offer often offer what I would call little pep talks or little encouragements and all these advice and critiques but all that they share with you when they don't get it only serves to further hurt and confuse you even more you know Jesus earthly parents weren't the only family members to misunderstand him. For a moment, I want you to imagine what it was like growing up as one of Jesus' younger brothers or sisters because the scripture tells us he had both. You know, in my middle school years, I had a pretty good friend that I spent some time with and I would often go over to his house and uh, spend time there with him and often sometimes with his family. Now, in my middle school and high school years, I was a goody-goody. I was afraid of not turning in homework on time. I was afraid of getting in trouble. And so I, did, I was always striving to have good behavior and do good work on my testing and homework and all of that stuff. You know the kind of type that I'm talking about. And uh, I had this friend that I often would spend time with. And um, later on, I was talking to his brother when I was at, in his wedding and we were at the rehearsal dinner and uh, during that time I didn't know it his brother was surveying me to find out if I'd be worthy enough to go out with this girl he knew that him and his wife were friends with and so at the end of that dinner he slipped me her name and number uh, after deeming me worthy enough and today uh, we're married but now I'm pretty good friends with him as well as his younger brother whom I was with friends with in high school but it wasn't until my adult years that I found out in talking to him that his mother would often reference me to try and get them to do things sometimes. For instance, my name would be thrown around like this. Both of you need to clean your rooms. I bet you Richard's room is clean. <laughs> now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that as a teenager, that would get old pretty quick. And it's a wonder 
they didn't want to have if they didn't want to have anything to do with me but they remain my friends but with that in mind imagine what it was growing up with the son of god the perfect sinless can do nothing wrong jesus as your older brother why can't you clean your room like jesus why can't you behave like Jesus? Why don't you do your chores like Jesus? Don't know how much of that type of thing went on, but if it did, when you add the fact that they were like their parents and didn't understand Jesus much and what was going on with him, it's easy to envision the scene that John describes in chapter 7 of his gospel. It is there that he writes this brief encounter with Jesus and his brothers. He says in verse 2, When the Jewish feast of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Now listen to their tone. You ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. And then John adds, For even his own brothers did not believe in him. You know, there's a loneliness that comes from being misunderstood, but there's also a loneliness that comes from being rejected. I would imagine that Jesus' brother's words hurt him pretty deep. And I wonder how many of us have experienced that type of pain as well. It hurts deeply to be rejected, especially by those closest to us. Whether it be a parent, a sibling, a child, or even a spouse. Psalm 69, 8 through 9, prophesies concerning Jesus. It says, I am a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. Isaiah 53, 3 prophesies, He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. John 1.11 records, He, meaning Jesus, came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. In the past several weeks, we've been looking through our Lenten sermon series and the trial of the centuries and seeing just how much Jesus was mocked, humiliated, and scorned by so many during his trials and crucifixion. Jesus knew what it was like to be rejected on a level that none of us can even begin to imagine. Jesus not only knew what it was like to be left out, but he also knew what it was like to be let down. After sharing the Last Supper with his closest disciples, Jesus said to them in Mark chapter 14, verse 27, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Now, we're with you in it to the end, Jesus. We're not going anywhere. 
Let's see what happens. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. You hear what he's doing? Yes, he was God in the flesh, but that flesh felt everything, including the emotional, psychological, and physical stress of the moment. Peter, James, and John, if you read through the Gospels, you notice they were kind of his closest group, his closest friends, if you want to call them that. And he pulls them aside and he says, I need you to pray and keep watch with me tonight. Now keep in mind, what have they just guaranteed? We're with you in it till the end, Jesus. He's saying, pray, pray with me. If there was ever a time Jesus needed some peer support, if you will, it was that night before he would bear the weight of our sins. Yet we read in verse 35, Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Can you almost hear behind that? You just told me you'd be willing to die for me. And you're asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. I bet they didn't. After assuring him they were with, it, with him in it till the end, and they can't even stay awake for a couple hours? Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Can you imagine the loneliness and betrayal in that kiss? The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. I know Jesus knew it was coming. But I don't know how much it took away the sting of that moment. You see, he was betrayed by those one of those closest to him. He was denied three times by another one who said that he'd be willing to die for him. And he was deserted by all 
the rest who had said the same. He knew what the loneliness of being abandoned was. But as great as that lonely wa loneliness was that night, nothing could compare to the loneliness that he experienced on the cross. When we flip over one chapter to Mark chapter 15, verse 33, it says, At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's important for us to consider here, he is quoting Psalm 22. Some see that as a cry of despair. Some see that as a cry of triumph because if you read the whole chapter of that psalm, it ends in a moment in an attitude of faith and triumph. But I don't think we need to take away from the isolation of this moment. Jesus, throughout all of time, had experienced nothing but perfect love and fellowship with his heavenly Father. God the Son and God the Son, God the Father in perfect fellowship with one another. But as Isaiah tells us in fifth chapter 59, verse 2, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. On that cross, Jesus bore our sins. And then in bearing our sin, he endured the separation in that moment that was caused by our sin. You know, you don't know the horror of a pain or a loss until you experience it. And in that moment, God the Son, who had enjoyed perfect fellowship with God the Father, suddenly experienced that fellowship being severed. I don't think we need to take away from that sense of forsakenness. And you want to talk about a sense of isolation. Because we know that many of the folks there in that moment had been mocking and making fun of him. And his closest followers had abandoned him. So he hung there suffering alone. Then in verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Don't miss that. The curtain that's being referred to here was the curtain that separated priests from the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant rest where God's holy presence was. They would only enter that holy of holies once every year and that was not without a lot of preparation on the day of atonement. But when that curtain was severed right down the middle it symbolized Jesus taking that separation and sin from the world and paying the price for it and opening up access to God himself so that we could have a personal love relationship with him. That's why he went through his isolation. Jesus was forsaken so that we could be forgiven. Jesus was rejected so that we could be reconciled with God. And Jesus experienced loneliness so that we might experience eternal love. That's what Jesus did. That love, I believe, is described, we get a glimpse of it in Revelation chapter 21, where John 
called a vision of the new heaven and the new Jerusalem upon Christ's return. And we read there that he said, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, don't miss this, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain or might I add COVID-19 or loneliness. <laughs> For the old order of things has passed away. That was what was secured on the cross by Jesus. And that is our hope here this evening. So tonight, I just want to ask, if you're watching this, wherever you are, whenever you're watching, it may not be on Thursday night, April 9th. It may be sometime later. But have you accepted Jesus as the one who bore that sin for you? and endured that separation from God for you so that you wouldn't have to. A lot of people say, well, I, I do a lot of good things or I go to church or I do this or I do that. It's not about a matter of what we do. It's a matter of what he did. And all of us, the scripture tells us, all of us need him. We need Jesus because he's the one that paid the price for us. Jesus is a gift from God, but it's just like any other gift. If we don't receive that gift, and we don't open that gift, and use that gift, so to speak, it's kind of useless. But when we receive Jesus as our Savior, acknowledging that we need the forgiveness that is secured for us on that cross, that he died in our place, and we give our lives in return to him and live for him, make him our Lord and leader. When we do that, we receive God, the Holy Spirit, and we become a part of his family. And so right now, I'm going to take some time to pray. And if you are already a Christ follower, I encourage you just to pray along with me for those that might be praying this prayer. But if you need to accept Christ, if you've never done it or you're not certain, I invite you just to pray along with me at this time. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for sending Jesus. We acknowledge that we have sinned, that we have fallen short of your glory, as the scripture says, that we've really blown it at times, even at times that we didn't realize it. And we confess our need that we need Jesus as our Savior. We ask him to come into our hearts and take over our lives so that he can lead us as Lord. We thank you for his blood that was shed, for his body that was broken, and for the loneliness and isolation that he endured so that we wouldn't have to experience it and we ask your Holy Spirit to come into us to guide us and direct us from this day forward in Jesus name we pray amen if you just prayed that prayer with us let me say welcome to the family we're glad to have you as a part of us I would encourage you to email me here at the church I'd love to hear from you at pastor at shilohreformchurch.com you could go to our website at www.shilohreformchurch.com and link in there but I just want to welcome you and when I ask you at this time if you haven't already done so go to your house and just pause for a moment we're going to break and have a time of prayer and reflection and you'll have plenty of time find a simple loaf of bread or crackers or whatever you have at your disposal get some grape juice and wine and uh I want to invite you to share in the Lord's Supper, the same supper that he shared 
with his disciples a little over 2,000 years ago. Now, I imagine him sitting around that table, and he knew all that he was about to bear, that none of them had a clue that he was about to bear, just like in some ways many of us are enduring isolation, not just due to the pandemic, but in many other areas of our lives. And he'd shared that meal, even with them, even though they would let him down. And he knows you and I have let him down. But that didn't stop him from making this meal possible. So if you will, find some bread, find some grape juice, wine, whatever you have that's the closest thing to it, and come back and join us here in a second. For the rest of us who are currently Christ followers, I want to encourage you to take the rest of this time during this moment as we pause for some brief music to pray and reflect upon where we are in our relationship with Jesus. And to also reflect on the awesomeness of his sacrifice and love that he has for us. Let's pray and reflect. If you'll join me in prayer right now. Father God, wherever we find ourselves here tonight, whether we're gathered in a room with family, or whether we're in a room that it looks like we're by ourselves, we join our hearts together as one in your Son, Jesus Christ, right now, knowing that Spatial distance cannot separate us, but that we are united and in communion deeply with one another. We ask for you to bless these elements that we have before us. We pray that you'll bless the bread and the wine or the grape juice or the crackers or whatever we have. And we recognize now that these are no longer just ordinary items of food, but they are specially set apart for this time for you to commune with us and for us to commune with one another. We pray that we will experience the power of Christ's love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we go back to the Gospel of Mark, we see where Jesus shared the Last Supper and what he said to his disciples. It says, While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. This is the body of Christ that was broken for us. Take and eat. This cup of grape juice, wine, whatever you have, represents Christ's blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. It's the blood of the covenant. Take and drink. Let us pray.
Father God, I think of in your word when it describes your glory. We often are at a loss of words to try and describe it, whether it be majesty or whatever. But behind that Hebrew word is heaviness. I pray that each of us in this moment, when we reflect upon the sacrifice of Christ, can sense deep in our hearts the heaviness of your presence that assures us we are not alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.